All right, so let's start talking about virtual memory. So uh, remember that we had this virtual memory abstraction. We talked about reasons why we like it. Process address space isolation allows us to keep processes from interacting with each other in un, uh, uncontrolled ways. And so that's really nice. And um, the, the uh, other thing that we talked about is the application binary interface that the operating system needs to impose. Uh, it becomes very easy to design that with virtual memory. We'll talk about the third reason why we like virtual memory a lot today, which is that it allows us to overcommit physical memory resources to applications because the reality is applications aren't using all of their memory at any given time. So we can overcommit quite easily and have a system that's able to run a lot more applications. So anyway, this is all review. Uh, we have programs emitting virtual addresses which go through some translation and it ends up going to the main memory as physical addresses which may be very different from the virtual addresses. And we talked about three ways of doing that translation uh, which again you can go back and look at the um, previous lecture which I will get posted today. Um, you know, to see the, the details of that, which are quite interesting, at least if you like history. So, um, but normally we use paging for that, and uh, we have page tables, per process page tables are pretty simple. We have lots of memory now, so we don't need to do crazy things like inverted page tables so much, thankfully. Uh, and yeah, so we talked about all of that kind of stuff last time. We won't spend too much time on that. But yeah, the big thing that I want to talk about today is the fact that now we can overcommit memory. And so this means that I have to have some way of moving data out of a virtual page, which is, you know, occupying a page frame to some backing store or swap device we normally call it. Okay. So uh, yeah, the observation being that programs don't always access all of their memory. And this includes program text. It includes uh, the heap, the memory heap, although frequently the, a lot of the memory heap is utilized. It includes the stack. It includes some stuff that we can actually swap out to disk, which means that we can then use that memory for something else. So that's really neat. If we are going to provide this kind of capability, then you can imagine that the page table has to specifically support this kind of thing. So we need to have some kind of additional information, typically a valid bit or a present bit, something like that. Remember IA32 calls it present to say whether or not it is actually occupying a frame. And so, yeah, the valid uh, bit basically just says, is this in memory or is it not in memory? And typically the way these systems work is that if the valid bit is zero, then the part of the page table that would normally be utilized by the MMU is available for the operating system to use. So you can stuff some other details in there to say this is where the page is actually stored on disk. So remember, let's just talk, again talk 32 bits. We've got 32-bit page table entries, one bit for present, and then we have 31 bits that we can use to figure out where this thing is stored if it's not actually in memory. Okay? So that's how these systems typically work. And if you do the math, like you know, 2 to the 31 times... 4096, you can see, wow, I can have a really huge amount of swap space for my computer to, to utilize. So that's really nice. And different operating systems have different ways of breaking that down, which we'll talk about a lot more in the future. Because, you know, Linux has actually two ways of doing it now. It used to only have swap, a swap partition, but now it can do a swap file as well. Windows, for a long time, has just done a swap file. And uh, I don't remember what OS X does, but you can, you, you can look at these various things. So we have some way we need to be able to encode where the page's data is if it's not in memory. And so that's the useful thing we can do with the page table. Okay, so all the MMU does is it just looks up the page table entry. We already talk about that quite a bit, so we don't need to go into any more detail. And it just looks at that, and if the valid bit is 1, it does the translation exactly as I have laid out here. I shouldn't say exactly because we have two levels on IA32 and, and various other processors have slightly different mechanisms. But if the bit is invalid, then basically we generate a page fault. Okay? And because it's a fault, remember the processor uh, invokes the operating system. If the OS is able to resolve the fault, then it goes right back and re-executes the same instruction. Now, of course, in Pintos right now, we just 
say, okay, page fault means bad program, and we kill the program. Okay? Uh, and that's kind of one of the big things about Project 5 is that you will start saying, well, page faults don't necessarily mean bad programs or bad kernels. They may actually mean I just need to bring the page into memory. Okay, and so this is, again, the example that we use in CS24, so I won't spend too much time on it, but you can see we have four page frames. We have, right now, six allocated pages, and we have eight uh, you know, potential virtual pages that we could utilize. And so some of these things are in memory, and some are only on the backing store. Two of these pages are not allocated, so if we wanted to, now, normally... <laughs> Page zero is not allocated because we want dereferencing null to cause the program to explode. So almost always you will never see a page mapped in for uh, virtual page zero. Is that a strict requirement? No. You could write the first OS where minus one is null or something like that if you wanted to do something fun and different. Okay. So yeah, program access is a word in virtual page two. So that's going to fall in PTE2 because we're starting from zero. The flag is 1 for valid, so the MMU can handle that translation all by itself. Okay, That is not very challenging. Now, if uh, somebody accesses a word in virtual page 6, now again, the valid bit is 0, but the rest of that space in the page table entry is available to the operating system, so the OS somehow encodes that that page is actually stored at some location in the backing store. Again, if it's a file, it might be just a, a straight offset from the start of the file or a page number from the start of the file. You can do whatever you want. Okay, Linux, I, if I remember correctly, actually breaks it into some number of bits which specify the swap device, be it a file or a partition or whatever, and then the remaining bits are the slot number in the swap device that you actually talk to. So there's various ways that OSs can do that. Okay, so uh, the MMU says, I can't do this. It generates a page fault. The kernel steps in, says, oh yeah, this is something that's actually available, but it's on the backing store. So it goes ahead and starts the process of moving that into memory. And this is where, hey, guess what? We have mechanism and we have policy. So we need to figure out which frame we want to use for this new, you know, to load virtual page six in, which means we have to choose one to evict. And the choice of who to evict is policy. And we'll talk about uh, an actual, uh, there's a significant number of very interesting policies. So we'll talk about some of those in the next few lectures. Um, but let's just say that we pick virtual page four. If it's changed, we need to save its changes. If it hasn't changed since we loaded it last time, then we, we don't really need to do anything else. So that's another thing that we need to do. And so you can see that it's nice to also keep a dirty bit. Okay. And uh, so typically what you'll see on processors, if they're really nice to programmers, is they'll have things like, has this been accessed? Is it dirty? Not every processor has that. One of the fun things, I sometimes mention this in CS24 exams, is that the ARM processor's MMU is not smart enough to keep track of, has the page been accessed and is the page dirty? So you have to emulate that capability, and if you look at the Android, or the, the kernel that's used for Android, it actually has code in there to emulate those bits, because you don't have that on the processors that Android typically runs on. Okay? So anyway, that's all fun, but uh, anyway, we have to go ahead and figure out if we need to evict the page, and if we do, then we save it to the backing store. That frees up the page frame. We have to update the page table to record that that page is now on the backing store only. And then we can load that page that we'd like into the page frame. Okay? And then we change the page table entry to point to that. So all of this is stuff we've already talked about. We only added a slight bit of new information, so I don't think that this is going to be terribly confusing to anyone. Okay? Does anybody have any questions? So this is like <laughs> the first level. We haven't even gotten to the level that you'll have to understand for, for Pintos, of course. So um, one of the things that's interesting is that these page table entries have additional information that we can utilize, but we have to be careful about using it because if we happen to have a situation where 
multiple page table entries mapped to the same physical page frame, well, we're only going to see these bits updated for the page table entries through which the access occurred. So in this case, I have process 1 has PTE5, which points to the page frame 1, and process 2 has PTE1 that points to the physical page frame 1. Okay? And so I have these two entries, each with their own dirty bits, and so if I have a situation where one process writes to the page and the other process does not write to the page, then I'm only going to have the dirty bit set to one in one of these situations. That's one of the challenges that you run into with shared memory, is that you have to make sure you have all these different page table entries pointing to the same frame, and only the PTEs that are used by the MMU will get updated. Okay? So that is a pretty key thing to be aware of. Now, everybody will have to think about this at least a little tiny bit on Project 5, because pages in Pintos are mapped from the kernel address space and also often from the user address space. And so you get to choose which address you use to access the physical page frame, and obviously that will dictate which page table entry gets marked dirty. Most people solve that problem by only using the user address to access the pages data. Okay? Problem solved. That was easy. Um, if you also happen to decide to do things like shared memory, which is, uh, I think, I can't remember. I don't think it's required. I think it's an optional thing in the uh, fifth project. Then you have the same issue, except it's a little bit more challenging. But you almost always have this situation that you will have multiple page table entries referring to the same page, and you have to be careful about these bits that keep track of what's going on. Okay, so process one writes to virtual page five. That sets the dirty bit to one for page table entry five for that process. Okay, then we decide later that we want to swap out process two's virtual page one. Well, that's fine. Um, except for the fact that we have this page that's dirty, but if we just look at process 2's page table, then we don't remember that it's dirty. Okay, So that's all that I'm really saying here. Um, <clears throat> normally, the way that we can deal with this is we have supplemental information that we keep track of for the various pages. This should probably illustrate almost immediately that the information in the page tables is insufficient for implementing a virtual memory system. Okay? It's necessary. It's what the processor requires. It's kind of like uh, the minimal necessary for the processor to provide the, the uh, facilities that it has. But it's not enough for the operating system. The OS has more sophisticated abstractions, so we need to keep track of a little bit more detail. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> various options. One is that you could go through all the page table entries that refer to a particular page frame before you evict that page. And that's fine. That's one thing you can definitely do. Uh, you know, that that's clearly is going to have to be stored somewhere then. Okay, this is a shared page. It's used by these processes. This is where it's used. Okay, And uh, if you think about it, that's actually a good thing because if you evict a page that other processes are using, you need to make sure you update their page tables as well. Okay, So if we evict the contents of frame 1, back to the backing store, then we need to update both processes page tables to record that those things are now out of virtual, or yeah, I should say out of the physical memory and back on the disk. Okay. All right, so anyway, um, these are, this is a great example where you start to see, okay, I need to have a little bit of extra information to manage this virtual memory abstraction uh, in an efficient way. Okay, so the, the operating system kernel starts keeping track of additional data. Okay, any questions? Probably not going to be something you have to think about terribly heavily for Pintos unless you decide to do things that are more sophisticated, which um, only do if you really, really got everything done, please. Because uh, I, I kind of mentioned this before. There was one team years ago that decided that they wanted to um, make the uh, kernel, the Pintos kernel, paged. And... They never got anything working. <laughs> so, you know, 
it's it's one of those wonderful things and terrible things about Caltech students that you say, oh, I'm going to achieve the hard goal, and that's a great thing to do, except when you have two weeks to get it done, and then it's a terrible idea. <laughs> so anyway, just uh, be, be conservative in your goals for this stuff. Okay, so yeah, uh, we can move parts of a process into and out of memory, which is really nice. Now remember that the alternative was standard swapping. We talked about that last time. Standard swapping means I have to move the entire thing out, and then I have to move the entire thing in. And so if you had a process, even if the program was not very large, but it had one or two gigs of data in its data segment, then, and you had to move that whole thing, now you've got a significant delay of several seconds to move that data back and forth. So that's terrible. No, nobody wants to use a system like that. So uh, paging is much nicer in that way. We can move it in and out in pieces. There's a name for this kind of approach called demand paging, which I know I mentioned in passing last time, where basically we only swap stuff into memory. It's kind of lazy, right? We only swap stuff into memory when it's actually used. So what does that mean? Well, almost every time that I try to access something, I generate a page fault. And then I know I need it. So running a program stored on disk. This is an excellent example because this is the kind of thing you'll have to do for uh, the Project 5 is basically when instead of loading the program, actually allocating a whole bunch of pages and stuffing them into the process's page table, stuffing the data into the pages and getting that all set up, which is what happens in process.c right now. That's why I know you're, you're going to care about that code because you care about it in project 5. Um, you just set up a page table structure that says, okay, these are all the pages in the process, but they're all initially invalid. And what you do is you set it up so that those pages reference the file, the binary file on disk. And then what happens is as the program starts running, you know, you call start and it tries to run main. And so you hit the first instruction in the program and instantly you get a page fault because none of the program has been loaded yet. And so the kernel says, oh, okay. And it pulls that chunk of data into the program and into the uh memory, I should say, and it starts running it, and when you run out of that page and you start into the next page of the program, you get another page fault, and then it loads that, and then, you know, you keep doing this, and the idea is, I only load the parts of the program that I actually need, and for something like Microsoft Word or <laughs> Emacs, anything jimungus, it makes a lot of sense. Okay, so yeah, accesses new pages, cause page faults and so forth. So it's a pretty nice approach. And so this is called demand paging. And you can imagine in the context of eviction as well, you know, because as a program runs, there may be portions of the program that you leave and you never come back to. That's really common as well. And so basically the pages that you haven't used in a long time get evicted. They become victims to the uh, paging policy. And so you get them out and then you only have the pages that the program actually needs to run in memory. So that's really helpful. Okay, processes heap. Same thing. You set up a heap. So you say initially you get 2 megabytes, or hey, you get 16 megabytes. I'm feeling generous. And you set up all the mappings in the operating system, but the page table says all of these things are not present. And so what happens is as the process actually interacts with the heap, then you start handing over memory and that causes page faults and that causes the operating system to actually assign space to the program. Okay. And yeah, if you need to grow the heap, then you just go ahead and record a whole bunch of new entries in the page table structure saying, all right, you can have this area now, but you don't actually hand it over and then when the program tries to access it, you get more page faults and it assigns the data. Okay. So this is really nice. Again, this is what most operating systems do is something along this line. Now, uh, here's a question for you. If when I start a program, I always know that the page where main is <laughs> is going to be accessed right away and generate a page fault, then what I can do is actually be clever and just preload that page. Because I know I'm going to generate a fault if I don't, so why not do that? Same thing with the stack. Top of the stack, well, why don't I just go ahead and preload that page? 
If I have something in the memory heap, maybe I should just go ahead and preload some of those pages. So um, I'm going to talk about it in a second. There is a distinction between pure demand paging, which has sort of the most minimal memory usage required, but it has these slownesses that are part of it. If I preload things, then yes, I have a, a heavier memory footprint, but I know I'm going to be accessing those things anyway, so why not make the system more performant? So not everybody does pure demand paging. A lot of times we like to prefetch things to make them faster. Okay, so yeah, at some point the kernel doesn't have any frames. This is where policy again comes into the picture as opposed to mechanism, which is to say, okay, I need to evict this page. That's the mechanism, and the policy tells us which page to evict. Okay. And like I said, there's some really clever uh, page replacement policies, which will do us a, a, sort of a, a quick run through a couple of those uh, policies that are used. I think I have a couple lectures devoted to that. Um, and then you have uh, this pure demand paging, which I already mentioned before. I basically only ever allocate pages when somebody actually accesses them, and I only evict pages when I absolutely need to. So I don't try to be preemptive at all. Okay, this has the smallest memory footprint possible, as far as the operating system is concerned, but it's not as efficient or performant as we'd like it to be. And so typically, the OS is... It tries to be preemptive in a couple of different ways, like it tries to preload stuff that it knows it's going to need. Like one thing you might notice, I don't think you have to do this in Pintos, thankfully, but if you're going to start running a program, prefetch like the first four pages. Okay, that's an easy thing to do. Uh, same thing with um, when I have pages sitting around, a lot of times operating systems will go and actively look for pages that can be evicted. So that's another thing. Or if I have dirty pages, go ahead and preemptively write them back to disk so that I don't have to wait until they're actually evicted. So you'll have a couple of ways that OS is trying to be more preemptive. Because the reality is the operating system isn't always busy. So it has some things that it can fit in to do extra work like that. So um, just these are some useful things to be aware of, the various approaches that people have. Now, copy and write, we also talk about this in CS24, so I can go ahead and spend a little bit less time talking about it. But uh, forking is a really common example of where copy on write is really helpful. All of you had some experience with that on the first project, forking off processes that were identical copies, but then it immediately turns around and execs something. Okay? So we can make that process really fast by using a private copy on write mechanism. And uh, I think I mentioned this, I might have mentioned this in the past, but historically, forking was a really expensive operation in original Unix systems because they would do a copy immediately. And again, if you had a large program and it forked, then it would be making a copy and that was just hideously slow. And so this copy on write mechanism actually was necessary to make this a practical approach, which is wild. You know, I think that uh, they had to use something that seems a little bit sophisticated just to make this a usable system. Okay, so yeah, parent-child process split. We share all the pages between them, but the MMU thinks they're read-only, so that if somebody tries to write, we generate a fault, and the OS can step in and do the private copy-on-write thing. Okay, and so typically the OS also has to keep track of how many processes are pointing to the private copy-on-write page, because once I get to the last, you know, let's say I have two processes sharing a page, one writes to the page, well, I make a copy, now that process has its own, now I only have one process using this other page, just change it to read-write. Private copy on write is done. So um, that's another thing that, that operating systems have to think about. Okay, let's see, we already are familiar with all this stuff, so we'll go ahead and jump over all of this. And yeah, like I was mentioning, this is um, this was really important in making Fork usable as computer programs started to grow. And uh, remember that a lot of times computers, earlier computers, like in the 50s and 60s, had magnetic core memory, which awesome technology. I wish that, I would love to have a USB drive for a magnetic core, like a brick-sized thing that holds like 24 kilobytes or something that you plug in. It's like 600 milliseconds or something to read a uh, word of data out of those core memories. So they're, they're quite slow. And uh, 
So, and this was the reason why forking processes with just copying was, was incredibly slow, because we had slow memories, programs started to grow, it was just prohibitive. Okay, now, um, I don't know, has anybody heard of vFork? vFork is very fun. So, um, vFork is basically for situations where you know you're immediately going to be throwing away the processes page table. When does that happen? Hey, that happens in shells all the time because I fork and then I immediately go and load some other program and start running it. So why make a copy of the page table? I'm sorry? Well, I don't understand what you mean. Yes, but uh, v4 can also preserve file descriptors, so that's fine. It's just that there's certain things that fork has to duplicate, and if you fork and you have to then go and do all the private copy on write mechanisms, so remember that fork also allows you to keep your file descriptors through the fork. So v4 also preserves all your file descriptors, but v4 doesn't set up private copy on write. V fork is like a really, it's like driving up a mountain road and do you have a railing beside you or not? V fork has no railing. So you can make changes in the child process and the changes are visible in the parent process. It's really fun. It's like, yay, here's a giant gun. Don't shoot yourself. <laughs> you know, that's kind of the idea. Yes? Uh, do people use it for inter process communication? I really hope not. There's like much safer ways of setting up IPC. You're right, it might be undefined. I'd have to read what vFork's requirements are. Because you have the same stack. You've got some really weird things that you're sharing. And so, I, I, yeah, it may be really bad. Like with IPC, the safe thing to do is like you can have one program open up a, or memory map a file. Dev0 is a great idea for memory mapping. And then you fork, and now both the parent and child have dev0 mapped to the same address range, and you can use that as shared memory. Or you can just set up a shared memory area and share data that way. So there's like much safer ways of doing IPC than vFork. Um, well, I'm getting the willies even thinking about it, but if you want to try that, be my guest, I guess. Um, but anyway, yeah, so the idea is that uh, since I know I'm going to immediately exec, why go through the process of setting up Copy on write. Okay. So this is fun. This is one of those interesting situations where... Um, now, could you do this in our shells? Probably not. That's, that's kind of an interesting issue because the child process does have to set up um, page frames. I'm sorry, not page frames. What am I trying to say? They have to set up uh, redirection and things like that. So it may be that the child... Um, the, like in, in uh, sophisticated shells, we couldn't use vFork very effectively. So you'd have to read about it. Yeah. That is a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I'd have to read more about v4. Yeah. It's an interesting function. Yeah, I've never actually used it myself. I just know that it exists, and I know this is the reason why. So, uh, yeah, just you might you might have fun reading about that if you're bored. Okay, so let's uh, talk about the last few things for this lecture real quick and then we'll wrap up for the week. Uh, I already mentioned that uh, this whole page aliasing issue kind of points out the fact that the OS needs to keep more details than just what the processor has for its page table entries. Okay? That is something that you should embrace because that's just kind of the reality. And it turns out that it's also helpful to keep track of every page frame. So you have a frame table, and then each process has its own page table, and it's supplemental information as well. And so, um, like I say here, sometimes we call it a supplemental page table. Linux just calls them VM area structs. It's got a, a linked list of VM area structs that describe the virtual memory areas, or segments, or sections, or what, whatever you'd like to call them. And there's a lot more detail than just what's in the page table. Okay. So you can think of the page table is what the processor needs, and the supplemental page table is what the OS kernel needs to resolve page faults. 
Okay, so that's why we have additional details here. Okay, so yeah, this is um, again. I, I definitely include this this uh, diagram in CS24. So you've probably seen it, whether you remember it or not. Uh, task struct represents a thread in Linux, and remember Linux. And, and I, when I say thread, I mean a user space thread, because Linux. Uh, has a one-to-one -one mapping between kernel threads and user space threads so that, you know, threading is supported natively in the kernel. So task struct points to mm, which is the memory management details, and then mm struct has a page directory, which points to the base of the page table hierarchy for the process, and then you have mmap, which describes the memory mapping. And so when you call mmap, that's one of the things that it affects. It creates and modifies VM area structs, as well as modifying the page directory as, as needed. Okay, so that's enough about all that. And so basically, um, yeah, I'll throw up this information as well. VM start, VM end, no surprise that they say this is the region of memory. Those tend to be page aligned, because why not? <laughs> it's probably dumb not to have them page aligned. Uh, protection details and then other flags. So if you want to say, hey, this is copy on write, or something like that. Again, so this tells you how to resolve page faults. What do you need to do? And the nice thing is that this is additional information and we keep it in a linked list so you think, okay, that's slow and it happens to be ordered by ad address so that your, your VM start, VM ends should be in order so that it's easy to keep track of your, your areas. Um, when I have normal memory accesses, it just the processor is using the MMU, the MMU is using the page directory. We don't touch any of this at all. We don't need it because all of our stuff is handled by the processor and hardware. So we don't even need to access this information. But if I have a fault, then I need to know how do I resolve this fault. And this is where the supplemental information is so critical. Okay? So I'm, again, we've talked about some of this before, so I won't spend too much uh, time on it, on, on these details. So MMU raises a fault. And the page is currently not in the address space, otherwise we wouldn't have a page fault. Here, remember, we could also have a protection fault if we have a right to a read-only section or something like that. We won't talk about that right now. And so the kernel basically looks at the address. Is this a valid address for our virtual memory area? And again, some of you may have seen this already, but the page fault handler, what it does is it, um, the processor, at least I, um, the x86 processor stores the faulting address in a specific register. I think it's CR2. And then basically the page fault handler is responsible for reading that out right away because CR2 will get blown away almost immediately uh, by other things happening on the processor. So it's like pull that out real quick. And then that's the faulting address. It can use that to see does it fall into one of my virtual memory areas. If not, okay, the process was bad. Let's send it a sig seg v signal and make it go away, okay, unless it decides to handle segmentation faults. Okay. So you can see already, okay, this is where the supplemental information is really helpful. Okay, so if that wasn't the situation, then we have a valid page, but it's just not in memory. So clearly I need to do something to give the process some memory to be able to perform this memory access. So like I say, it's either swapped out to storage or it hasn't been allocated, so it could be in the heap, and it hasn't actually been uh, assigned to the process yet. So if it's swapped out, then we go ahead and start loading the page. That's going to take a few million clocks, so why don't I go do something else while I wait? Otherwise, um, the kernel can allocate a new page, and this is where it's kind of interesting, because it could be unallocated in a couple of different ways. If it's not allocated and it's not backed by a file, I can just fill the page with zeros. If it is not allocated but it is backed by a file, then I might need to go and actually again fetch the data for that location from the file before I hand the page over. So you see there's various situations that can occur in this situation. Okay, any questions? This is some of the stuff you'll have to do. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is that in the uh, Pintos supplemental page information, Typically, it'll say, um, you know, you, you have two things that can back a page. It can either be anonymous or it can be a file on the disk. Um, actually, I have to be careful because it could also, 
<laughs> be the backing store. So there's three things that it could actually be backed by. And uh, so that tells you where does the data need to come from. And then you say, how many bytes do I load for this page? Because, you know, if you're in just the end of the file and you start at the beginning of the page and only load, let's say, 300 bytes and the remainder needs to be zeroed out. So you have those kinds of situations that um, you need to handle properly. Okay, uh, if we have a protection fault, then I need, a, again, to look at the page table because it might be that it's just read-only because it's programmed. You shouldn't be allowed to write to it. So again, the uh, OS can go ahead and shoot a signal to the process. But if it's copy on write, then it's okay. So if it's copy on write, it can go ahead and perform that, that uh, mechanism. Okay. Any questions about this? So you can see that uh, we have these various interesting situations that can occur. And thankfully, I don't think you guys have too many things you have to support in Pintos. I think that you can get away with just doing uh, the most basic ones for the requirements of the assignment, which is still challenging enough. So it's not like you should feel bad that you don't get to do the hard stuff, because it's hard enough. But um, this is basically how this supplemental information is used for uh, resolving these kinds of situations. Okay, so if the memory area does allow the operation, the kernel basically does the thing. So copy on write, you know, not very exciting. We allocate another page. We duplicate the data into the page. And then we set up the page table entry. The only interesting nuance of this is we set up the page table entry so that now the page is writable, which means the next time the process writes to the page, then the, uh, the MMU will be fine. Okay. And, and again, what you notice then is that you may have a VM area struct which says this is private copy on write, but the page table might say it's okay to write to this particular region. So just because, you know, if you had like a 10 page section that was copy on write and the program writes to one of those pages, you don't have to then break the VM area struct into two. Why do that? Just configure the MMU to allow the, the page write to occur and then you're fine. Any questions? Okay. Uh, obviously, that uh, does complicate eviction, but uh, you know, those those things are relatively straightforward to figure out. Okay. So I think that's enough about that. So basically, next time we'll start talking about more of these details. Uh, I think we'll start getting into replacement policies and eviction and so forth, which is uh, very interesting. And like I said, I'll try to make sure that next week I give you guys some guidance on concurrency issues in uh, virtual memory systems because it's pretty, it's very concurrent. <laughs> so, all right, that's it for this week.